to uh, talk about things of the Word of God together. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Matthew, please. We're going to be doing some geography review. There will be some maps up on the screen. Uh, if you have a workbook, uh, you can open up to page 175. We're on lesson uh, 44. This is a review of the geography of the Gospels. We're focusing in Matthew specifically, looking at a couple of events that take place in Matthew. Uh, and so if you have, I guess I'll say two things. If you have a Bible that has maps, you might see if in the back you have a map that says something like Palestine during the life of Christ. Like I said, there'll be maps up on the screen, but they may be somewhat small. Um, the Bibles in the pew in front of you, we're about to find out together. I'm guessing don't have maps, but maybe they do. They do. So you can look up uh, one of the maps in the back of the Bibles in the pew in front of you if you would like one. It has Holy Land in the time of Jesus. Uh, so maybe a little bit of Bible gymnastics today as we're going back and forth between that map and the book of Matthew. But that might help you as you can see some things maybe a little bit closer, a little bit more clearly as we'll talk about some things that happen geographically uh, where Jesus uh, does some of his teaching, where the events in Jesus' life take place specifically in Matthew. You could do this in any of the Gospels, go through and look for locations, cities, rivers, other bodies of waters, stuff like that, and try to figure out where these things are located to have a better idea of where these things take place. But before we get into that, we'll do some review of our time periods, and we'll have a word of prayer uh, before we get into some of that. So I see people are settling in. You're finding your maps. You're finding Matthew. That's all very good. Let's review our 17 time periods. And before we start kind of getting into the chant of the repetition of them, uh, some things in our lesson this morning will relate to the first two time periods in particular, or really the first three uh, before the flood, the flood, and the scattering of the people. So, a very pop quiz here this morning. What are some of our major biblical events, and who are some of our major biblical characters from the before the flood time period? Adam and Eve, some of our major characters. Cain and Abel, Seth. Uh, so, what are some events that take place during this time period before the flood? The first sin. Before that, creation. creation is kind of a, a, a big one that's in there. Uh, Cain, Cain and Abel are big characters. The story of when Cain murders Abel is part of that. Kathy just recently went over that in her class with the kids back there. And all I can ever get out of Noah, I said, Noah, what did Cain do to Abel? He was so bad. Which I guess it is a sad story, but I, quite the full specific, but if you ask him, and if he actually is social enough to talk to you, I bet that's all he'll just say, sad, which it is, but not quite the in-depth detail. Let's move to that second uh, time period there, the flood time period. What major event happens in the flood time period? Tracy's raising his hand. Flood. Very good, the flood. All right, who are some of our major people from the flood? Noah. Uh, Noah's sons, so we've got four people there, and then all the wives. Uh, that many, not, I added an extra person there. There you go. So you have a total of eight main people from within that section. Lots of other people, too, that are part of that story, uh, but not necessarily named within all of that. And then the scattering of the people, what's our kind of major story within there? Tower of Babel is part of that. Tower of Babel is going to be part of that. Kind of within that, I include Genesis 10 and 11, if I'm going to do some mental breakdown. And that's arbitrary in a sense of it's just references. These are not hard lines that God has given us in how we divide Scripture. This is just things that may help us in kind of retaining or keeping anchor points in our memory. Um, so, not really specific people mentioned in there, but there are, well, there are lots of specific people mentioned through those genealogies of chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Genesis. Um, but, again, I'm doing all that with you now because there's going to be some things in our sermon this morning that relate to these three time periods, so you all get the extra bonus of having a little bit of priming the pump before we get to that. Let's pick up with period number four, and we'll work through them together in reviewing our 17 time periods of biblical history. We have before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, number four, patriarchs, number five, the exodus, number six, wandering in the wilderness, number seven, invasion and conquest of the land, number eight, judges, number nine, 
United Kingdom, number 10, Divided Kingdom, number 11, Judah alone, number 12, Captivity, number 13, Return from Captivity, number 14, very good, number 15, Life of Christ, 16, and 17, very good. All right, Corey's out here in our class this morning. Would you mind lead us in prayer before we get going? This morning's lesson, if you've already done lesson 44, is very much fill in the blank. There are 37 kind of fill in the blank geography related questions. And so if you've done the lesson, you've probably got a leg up on some of these things. Some of these things you might know just recalling from memory, but otherwise there's gonna be a question that comes up on the screen. Uh, we'll propose the question, look for audience participation in that, reveal the answer, it has a scripture, and unless there's something that's like, you have a, a major comment or question, which I am more than welcome to major, welcome major comments and questions this morning, this will probably be somewhat of a, a, a quick-paced review this morning. This is more of a review lesson than, again, more of a content lesson like we've done some of in the past. And so just heads up as if you're kind of like, we're moving, we are moving this morning. But if you have major comments, major questions, uh, I'm going to try to keep my eyes open. You can always try to get my attention. We can put those in as we need to. Before we get into that, there is an introduction for this material, and I really like this introduction, particularly this opening paragraph sentence. Take special note that every event in Jesus' life took place somewhere. He goes on to say, sometimes the exact location is not given, but more often it is. And think about that that the gospel writers took the time to say, Jesus was here and this happened. They could have just said a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and then just thrown in content of things that took place. Here's a guy who one time, once upon a time told a story. Once upon a time, this guy died and he rose from the dead. But the gospel writers constantly are talking about real places and real people and where Jesus is going as he's doing these things. And as we've talked about throughout this class, while some of these sites may have been lost through uh, geology and archaeology so far, we have not found them, and we may never find some of these cities or locations. We have found some of them, and we're finding that these are real places that existed. They are on the other side of the world. They're very far away and removed from us, both time-wise and distance-wise. But hopefully it builds our faith to look at this fact, that the stories of Jesus seem less remote when we realize that he walked over hills, and valleys and dealt with the same elements that we have as he taught his great lessons and resisted all temptations that came his way. That last sentence is a quote from our material by Brother and Sister Waldron. So as we're going over this list of 37 questions this morning, again, this is not one of those lessons of I expect you to remember by next Sunday, what was the answer to number 17? And I hope that We'll remember some of those details of where these places take place, but this is more about seeing how the Lord worked and how all the things he went through, through his teaching and through his ministry, leading to the cross and his resurrection. So, you got your Bibles in Matthew. Maybe you've got a map close by as well. Let's go to our geography of the Gospels. All these passages coming from Matthew this morning. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. We have record of that in uh, Matthew chapter 2. And verse 1, where did Joseph take Jesus to escape Herod? Egypt. There's that arrow that was up there that's leading this way, going down over towards Egypt. Question number three, where did Jesus grow up? Nazareth. And Matthew 2 and verse, Matthew 2 and verse 23. Where did John the Baptist begin his preaching? The wilderness of Judea. Uh, so we have just kind of this section over here. We'll get to some more about John, I think, in just a little bit. 
Where did Jesus come from to be baptized, and where was he baptized? So two parts of this question here. Where did Jesus come from in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13, and where did he go? Came from Galilee. That's where Nazareth is. That's the region he's from, and went to be baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, approximately this area, many people guess, kind of on the eastern side particularly, where did the Spirit lead Jesus to be tempted? We read about this in Matthew chapter 4. Just says the wilderness. That's right. Maybe somewhere over just west of the Dead Sea. Uh, this is question number 7, if you're following along on the workbook. Where did Jesus go when he heard John had been put into prison? Galilee. This is when he's, when he's going to Galilee, what is he really about to start getting into? preaching and teaching in his ministry. Uh, Mark has a very short introduction of this. Matthew's given a little bit more details leading up to it, but I think most of the gospel writers record that John's been arrested, and they'll come back to that detail later, but Jesus is getting into his ministry now, taking up the same message, including the fact that I'm the one that we've been talking about. Miss Rebecca? Uh, Ms. Rebecca making kind of a content point, in case you didn't get a chance to hear, about Jesus' baptism that we talked about just a second ago. And the fact that John, uh, in John chapter 1, it's very clear that this is helping John the baptizer see that Jesus is the one who's receiving the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, you know, it talks about you know, descending in that form of a dove there. John picks up on that. Jesus does say in Matthew chapter 3 to fulfill all righteousness, so the reasons of baptism not being for the forgiveness of sins for Christ, but that being an important idea of, that question will come up from time to time about why was Jesus baptized, and particularly for John, as that's going to also lead to the importance of John continuing to say, I'm not the Christ, and I can very clearly tell you that he is the one that's the Lamb of God. He's the one we're looking for. Corey, quickly. Yeah, I'm not really. I found that kind of interesting that you still would have questions even yeah. though Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. They had questions, you know, are you the one, you know, are you going to, where are you going to restore Israel? Right. You know, all these things they saw, the proof there, that was there, and yet they're still wondering. Yeah, which, I mean, we can, as having the full revelation of Scripture, we might look back and say, how could you wonder that? Right. But there's lots of people who still wonder about yeah. things today even like that too. Let's keep going. This is question number eight. Capernaum was in the borders of what two tribal territories? Zebulun and Naphtali. We're in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 13. You can see that, uh, in fact, uh, you can probably find it on your map, but this area here, if you can think about your 12 tribes allotment map, which is a different one, but that being kind of up here, north of where Judah is, uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, kind of in this area would be as well. Peter, Andrew, and James, and John made their living on fishing where? What body of water? The Sea of Galilee. Very good. Our next question. Jesus' frame spread throughout where? And I think that there's a couple of answers to this question, number 10. So where all 
is Jesus finding his fame spread if you go to Matthew 4 and verse 24. Syria, uh, and I think that this one's going to go out to some other ones, multitudes following Jesus, as it talks about in Matthew 4, 25. Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and then beyond the Jordan. So you're seeing that Jesus' popularity is growing all over the place. Syria would be kind of the ruling territory as a whole. Uh, we've talked about, uh, we, I don't think we've mentioned it specifically yet, but Capernaum uh, kind of being Jesus's, I use the term home base throughout his ministry. A lot of times it seems that like he goes back to Capernaum and kind of has a, a home there to a degree, even though he grew up in Nazareth. What's significant about Capernaum, where it lies as far as information spreading? Do we remember from our lesson last week? What's that, Glow? There are a couple of trade routes that head towards Damascus. So whether people are coming up from Jerusalem or whether they're following along the coast, maybe coming from more like Egypt or somewhere around there, as people would maybe be heading to Damascus or from Damascus, Capernaum's in that area. And so someone is heading to somewhere else, but they're in town, and they hear about this guy who's healing the sick and feeding multitudes. And whether that's just happened and they watched it or whether they're just hearing the news about the guy who comes back here regularly, that's going to help information spread to places like this and other places throughout the, the world. Uh, Jesus commended the faith of a Roman centurion who is from Capernaum. I jumped the gun a little bit on that one. Here's question 12. We're in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 23 to give you a heads up. Where did Jesus stop the storms? The Sea of Galilee in Matthew chapter 8 there. Where did Jesus heal two demonics? In Matthew 8, 28. Gerasene, I know there's, if you start to say a G word and you get a, an S sound in there, then I know what you're talking about at least. I'm going to say uh, Gergesia is some of the places that, some, how some translations put that. On the other side of Galilee here, uh, in this kind of more salmon-colored area. We'll get back to it maybe in this lesson, but it might be more of Mark. Um, in the book of Mark, Jesus does some work in the Decapolis in Mark chapter 7 after Mark chapter 5, where he heals the man with a thousand demons and tells him, go and tell everyone in your home and in the surrounding regions what I did for you, which is very uncharacteristic of Jesus throughout Mark because a lot of times he'll heal people and he says, don't make a big fuss about it. But here, this man is helping prepare the way for when Jesus eventually does come back and Jesus does work in that area. Uh, so remember that about Mark and Mark 5 and Mark 7. On their first preaching tour, where did Jesus send the disciples? Where was he focusing them? Israel. And so probably, uh, this map's going to kind of settle that around Judah. There would be other people who are from the house of Israel, other places, and be focusing on those who are Hebrews. Where did Jesus tell them not to go? To the Gentiles and Samaritans. Now, Jesus does work within those places at various times. This is, if you're following along, in verse, or question 15, where we are right now, uh, Jesus will go and he'll talk to the woman at Samaria, uh, or the woman from Samaria at the well. Uh, he'll go places beyond kind of more Galilee or Judea. He'll go up to Tyre and Sidon. He'll do things. But this message is primarily first being given to the Jews. In what cities will it be better than for those who rejected the cities that... Ah, that was a bad reading of a question. In what cities will it be better than for those cities that rejected Christ's disciples? So this is not a current location. This is a previous location. Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to put this down here at the bottom of the Dead Sea. That's an approximation. We've talked about that a while ago when we were in Genesis 19. What cities did Jesus pronounce his woes unto in, in Matthew chapter 11? Chorazin and Bethsaida, up here up on, by the Sea of Galilee uh, in this area where he's doing a lot of his ministry that's recorded in Matthew. What cities would have repented if they had seen the works that Jesus did around Galilee? Tyre and Sidon, uh, from Matthew chapter 11 
and verse 21. From what place did the scribes and Pharisees try to entrap Jesus concerning their traditions? Jerusalem. Jesus healed the daughter of a Canaanite woman where? Phoenicia, Tyre, and Sidon. This is Matthew 15, 21, and 22. Uh, This is one of those times that Jesus does go and he does work among the Gentiles. Matthew 15, 21 Jesus went away from there, withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon, maybe talking about after his confrontation with the Pharisees. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter, severely oppressed by a demon. You remember some of that interaction back and forth. Where was Jesus and his disciples when Peter declared his faith in Jesus' deity? Caesarea Philippi. There are a couple of Caesareas. There's another Caesarea down here along the coast, but this is the one up more north of the Sea of Galilee, Caesarea Philippi. Our next question, we are on question 21. Peter found money for the temple tax in the mouth of a fish where? At Capernaum, very good. Catching up with myself here. Jesus departed from Galilee and went where in Matthew chapter 19? Judea. Matthew chapter 19, that statement, again, the fact that the gospel writers record where Jesus is going and what he is doing, Matthew 19, 1 might just seem like a, a new chapter break to us, but there's something very significant that's going on in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 1. When Jesus is leaving Galilee, And heading towards Jerusalem, and this is kind of asking you to tap into some knowledge of what Jesus has been talking to his disciples about in Matthew 16 and 18, and some in this chapter, and I think in a chapter to come as well. What's the big deal that Jesus is leaving Galilee and going to Jerusalem? Why does Matthew bring out that point here now? I mean, Jesus has gone to Jerusalem before, but why is this significant? He's heading there to die. It's a big deal. All the gospel writers, or at least particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, somewhere in their gospels have a, he focuses on going to Jerusalem. And all the gospel writers spend a large chunk of their time focusing on Jesus' last week there. Think about Matthew 21. I'm jumping in a little bit here. Matthew 21 is the triumphal entry. Matthew 21 through Matthew 27 is all one week of Jesus' life. And a lot of that is even just a few days of Jesus' life there, focusing on that final week leading up from his entry to Jerusalem to his crucifixion just outside Jerusalem. Mark does that as well with Mark chapter 11 through Mark chapter 15. Luke does that around chapter 19, chapter 20 through chapter 23. There's this big focus on Jesus after he's been teaching his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. The gospel writers are trying to say, hello, hello, reader. He's leaving Galilee and he's going to Jerusalem because he's doing what the Father asked him to do. This is what it's all been leading up to. And so this, I'm jumping ahead from there. He's going towards Judea, beyond the Jordan, heading towards Jerusalem uh, because he's going there to fulfill the Father's work of going to the cross. This is, uh, I think we're on the second page of our material, if you've got a workbook, page 176 now. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus healed two blind men near what city? Jericho. Uh, And then the question in the workbook, has he traveled towards Jerusalem? That's as we were talking about just a moment ago. Jesus rode on a donkey from where to where? From that triumphal entry in Matthew 21, Where does he start and where does he go? Bethphage to the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. So again, this is one of those points of if you've got your Life of Christ map, you want to take a second to look at that. Uh, This circle covers Bethphage and Jerusalem and Mount of Olives kind of all together. Um, But I think right around here, you're going to have Bethphage, that's Jerusalem, that's Mount of Olives, I'm like barely moving my laser pointer, but maybe you can see some of that. And remember, as Jesus is traveling, I mean, he's traveling over hills and mountains, 
This is not he just called an Uber, popped in seven minutes down the road, and then he was there. And he's having to walk all of these places. And just stop and think about that, too, the fact that we've seen Jesus here. We've seen Jesus up here. He's gone up to Tyre and Sidon. He's been over here with his disciples. He's had to cross rivers. He's been out on seas. He's been up and over hills. He's been through valleys and wildernesses and cities. We're seeing Jesus going places and doing things. We're appreciating where he is and the things he'd have to go through along the way. Jesus was said to be a prophet of where? When people saw Jesus, they didn't necessarily call him the Messiah, but at question 26, people would say, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. There's a lot of thought of, hey, here's that prophet, you know, maybe just like any other teacher, or, you know, this is somewhat unique because God's been quiet for quite a while, and so they're like, John's been a prophet, here's this guy who's a prophet, and they recognize him about being Nazareth of Gal- from Nazareth of Galilee. We talked about this a little bit last week, too. Uh, uh, how many Jesuses would there have been during Jesus' day? Not our Lord, but how many people would have had the name Jesus? Probably several. Probably many people have had that. And so, again, the gospel writers are not just saying Jesus went to the cross or Jesus did this. A lot of times it's Jesus of Nazareth. Because particularly for their audience, when they're reading this, they might be like, I've got a cousin named Jesus, and I don't think we're talking about him. They're identifying who this guy is and where he is from. And while we may not think much of Nazareth, even as they tended to not think much of Nazareth, it's helpful for us to see and, again, identify. They're giving us details to show credibility and reliability of their message. Let me catch up with some answers up here. This is question number... 27. Jesus spent the first night of the last week before his death in what village? Bethany in Matthew 21 and verse 17. On what city did Jesus pronounce that they killed the prophets? Jerusalem. Uh, Where was Jesus when he predicted the destruction of the temple? The Mount of Olives. This is another thing that we talked about last week. The Mount of Olives is just east of of Jerusalem here. So if you've got your map, you can probably see that just east, a little bit northeast of Jerusalem. And it being at a higher elevation, you know, there they are on the Mount of Olives, and they're looking out. Jesus could probably see the temple with his disciples, and he could say, you see that? And he's going to give this discourse about the temple's destruction that's coming, and talk about things they're going to event. And this is not just out of the blue, but probably things of They could very well see, and they could probably start to figure out, well, how in the world would that work? I mean, if that temple is going to be destroyed, that must mean end of the world type of stuff, right? As they're thinking about. And that's why there's some of those, is Jesus talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? Is he talking about the final judgment? Is it a mixture of both? We're not going down that rabbit hole this morning, but you can see why he's bringing up that topic here and now. Uh, Question number... 30, a woman anointed Jesus' feet in what city? Bethany. Bethany. Very good. Where did Jesus go after eating the Passover meal? To the Mount of Olives. To a particular place called Gethsemane is what we're looking for here, a garden there in Matthew 26. Where did Jesus say he would meet his disciples after his resurrection? Galilee. Uh, from here, where was Simon from whom carried the cross of Jesus? So moving into his crucifixion, Cyrene. So Cyrene is actually north here on the coast of Africa, and he's up in Jerusalem. He gets called in that moment to carry the cross for Jesus. And where is Jesus crucified? Golgotha. Golgotha is just outside of Jerusalem, correct? He's probably uh, buried somewhere around there as well. Joseph, the one who buried Jesus, was from where? Arimathea, which is not far from Jerusalem, so maybe Jesus is buried around there. The angels told the woman at the tomb that Jesus was going to go where? Galilee. And so the fact that this is something that I had never really thought about until working through this lesson. You know, Mary Magdalene, some other women go to the tomb. 
to continue Jesus' burial process, and kind of giving him the proper anointing and stuff like that and dressing. And the tomb's empty, and they run and get Peter and John, as it talks about in John's gospel. So did they run to Galilee, or did the disciples not go back to Galilee yet at this point? But Jesus tells his disciples, I'll meet you there, and he appears to them. And, and it's just one of those things that I have to think about. I actually kind of assume things all happen in the same locale right away, really close. But Jesus does meet his disciples there in Galilee and spends time with them and appears before them. Uh, the account of the Great Commission recorded in Matthew is given on a mountain near where? Galilee. Near Galilee. It's our final question number 37 there. Again, that's a lot of just location stuff to go through. Uh, again, mostly pointing out Jesus is here, he's here, he's all around here, he goes over here some, he's down in Judea some, he's crossing the river some back and forth. We're not talking about it in this, but in John chapter 4, he specifically goes through Samaria to speak with the woman at the well. Uh, it's not talked about in, from our material today, but where is Jesus when he's talking with the Pharisees about marriage and divorce? Do you remember? Around here in Edemia. Who's from Edemia? Do we remember that? The Herod, family of Herod. Would Herod have any interest in Jesus' thoughts on divorce and marriage? Why might he have some interest in that? Because he's divorced, and he took his brother's wife. And we've talked about their family and just the interesting uncles marrying nieces and people wearing their brother's former wives or taking wives. It's, it's a mess, it's from our perspective especially. Um, but that's interesting to remember that when the Pharisees asked Jesus that question, it's not just they're trying to get a hot take issue. They're trying to get a hot take issue, especially on someone who might have some authority to do something about Jesus. You know, if Herod gets upset about that, he might arrest Jesus too. But that doesn't happen in that. But that helps us to give some more tension and conflict when we realize where these things take place. We've got a couple of uh, kind of review, review questions that are from the PowerPoint here uh, that are just about reminders of some major events about where things happened without maps. Before I get there, comments or questions about things that happen in Jesus' ministry. Mr. Beckham? So to pick up a couple of things what Ms. Rebecca said in case you didn't hear that, there are some things in the Psalms that 
talk about God. So, for example, I'm still in Psalm 89. I might ask you to turn to Psalm 89 and verse 9. This psalm is speaking of God and says, uh, just in verse 1, setting the scene, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. So there's praise being directed to God through this psalm. And through this psalm, there's mentioned in verse 9, you rule the raging of the sea. When its wave rise, you still them. Now, that, it's a song, so maybe it's a poetic license in here, but then you see Jesus literally doing that, and you have to think, well, the only person we ever know or we've ever talked about doing that is God himself. And so the apostles are there on the boat, in Matthew 8 and in Mark chapter 5, 4, 5, somewhere around there, and in Luke chapter 8 as well. And the question is, you know, Jesus says, be still, and it's not like after an hour the storm rolls out. It's, it's gone. It's done. There's calm. It's not even there's a, there's a little after effect. It's over. And there's this question of who can do this. And maybe in their mind is, well, I know, you know, Psalm 89 used to top the charts, and I remember singing along with that one, and it tells us that God stills the water, but that's hard to, to process and internalize, maybe, because they're afraid in that moment. Now, we're told to, to have that proper fear of God, but I don't think this is the fear that they're talking about there at that time. But there are things that we read through Scripture, again, in our Old Testaments, that we read about them, we read about attributes of God, and we see them being applied to Jesus. You can see that about things that People say, or the prophets talk about, uh, the one who's going to heal the sick, he's going to heal the blind, and you know, the, deaf will, or the, the deaf will hear, the mute will speak, those kinds of things. And here's Jesus doing this over and over and over and over again, and it's just like something is being pointed out here in this moment. And so we can see things about Jesus through the Old Testament, which is a very... If not the only reason, it should be a great motivator for us to read our Old Testaments to know and to understand more about Christ as well. Corey? You know, I find it interesting when it says there, blessed are those who have seen and believed. And now I'm just talking about like the apostles, disciples, and all this. But more blessed are those who have not yet seen but still believe. When we read stories like him calming the sea, could you imagine making that connection from Saul to this? Knowing who you're in the presence of, and I don't know how it's going to, I would just be terrified. I mean, you know, just knowing the awe and reverence of who he is, and that's just a scary thought to me. I mean, how, how could they, they have really felt? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's to see those things, to see what Jesus did, and to understand that people saw what Jesus did, and even that alone was not evidence for some. Some people watched him raise, raise Lazarus from the dead. And rather than saying, you are the son of God, they said, hey, I think this guy might actually be the son of God. Let's kill him, essentially, in those moments, rather than putting their faith in him. Let's get a couple of these review, review questions. So these are things maybe from Matthew, maybe outside, just some events that happen in the life and ministry of Jesus. Do you remember where Jesus' first miracle is performed? Particularly, I'm thinking about in John, in John chapter 2, John records the first sign he's going to reference, the first of seven. Where does that take place? Cana. Uh, Cana of Galilee. It's not, we don't have our maps up anymore. Uh, Jesus pronounced judgment on these three cities. Uh, Chorazin. I'm going to throw up all three. Bethsaida and Capernaum as well. Uh, this is a body of water that Jesus walked on at the Sea of Galilee. Remember that? Uh, this is, a, this is more of the event than the place. Caesarea Philippi was the site of what event that would unfold at Pentecost? So think more about Caesarea Philippi and what happened at Caesarea Philippi we talked about a moment ago. And that being brought up here as well. Uh -huh. We have, this is being the boyhood home of Jesus. Nazareth. The woman at the well is from this city in Samaria. Shikar, very good. The country where Jesus taught on marriage. Perea, that place beyond the Jordan, that place would be, again, kind of more in Herod's territory. Uh, this is the birthplace of Jesus and David. 
Bethlehem. Uh, Lazarus is raised from the dead at this city, Bethany. And Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus happens in Jerusalem and the Ascension, Mount of Olives. Very good. All right. Uh, that's all we have for our class this morning. Uh, I forgot to put the title slide for next week. We're done with the, with the ministry of Jesus. Again, this being history and geography class, this is not a content lesson. We could spend years on the ministry of Jesus and continue to mine good things from that. And hopefully we continue to do that through lessons, through other classes. But continue to move forward, we're already getting into the book of Acts and seeing, okay, Jesus has come He's done the work that his fathers wanted him to do. He's traveled all around Palestine and planted the seed, but now he's gone back to his father. What happens after that? The early church happens after that. And the early church is not just a Judea thing. It's a spreading all over the world kind of thing. And so next lesson uh, covers Acts 1 through Acts 12 and just kind of getting things started. And then from there, we'll spend some time in some of Paul's journeys and then in just a few lessons, we'll be done. We'll be wrapping up with, I think we have two total review lessons here, a, a review of Acts, and then we'll do a big review overall as we'll finish up. But that's all our class for today. You've got an extra two minutes and uh, 20 seconds to be done, to converse with one another and get ready for a worship service. We'll begin in just a few minutes. Thank you all for your participation and comments this morning.